Um, it's, it's no surprise to anybody if they go to my office, but um, I love superheroes. I always have. I'm not ashamed of that. I'll go to any superhero movie, uh, just about. And uh, I, I enjoy that. And I think um, that's true with a lot of men, especially, because uh, I think ingrained within all of us is just this, uh, this deep sense that we need to be rescued from something. We may not know what, but, but inside each of us, there's this deep sense that we need to be rescued. And then on, on the other hand, there's this sense that God's created men with kind of this desire to, to protect and, and to save. That's another sermon, but th- that, that's part of the reason why uh, the superhero genre of movies are so popular right now, why they make so much money. It's because they kind of meet a need that, that, that we're looking for. Because we can go see those movies or read the comic books or watch TV show, whatever it is, and find in them a sense that answers the question, you know, what do I need? Why am I here? And I think it was in 78, I might have the date wrong, when the first Superman movie came out with Christopher Reeve. And, but ever since then, superhero movies have been popular. You know, it went from Superman to, to Batman and, and all these movies, and then eventually... Uh, kind of Iron Man back in the early 2000s started the, the, the Marvel trend with, with all these movies. And now you can't go a couple of months without some superhero movie being in, in the theaters. And I'm not complaining. But uh, there really is this, uh, this battle going on in our world between good and evil, which any superhero movie that you go to, there, there's that on the, the movie. All, all they are, no matter what, what movie you're at, it's a story between good and evil. You see it in scripture. You see it being played out in the world right now. And if we're honest, sometimes, sometimes it looks like evil is winning. Sometimes it looks like there's no hope. And it, it's like, man, if somebody doesn't come in here and, and rescue me, this, the evil's going to win. You know, it looks like the world's gone kind of cattywampus. And it's like, God, where are you? What are you doing? You know, are, do you even know what's going on? And it's like that through periods of time in the church. I, I read some statistic the other day, or maybe I heard it, but it said that there have been more martyrs, more people killed for their faith in Christ in the 20th century alone than in all of the centuries leading up to the 20th century. And it's kind of like when you turn on the news, and um, I personally don't see it so much uh, right now, but um, you know, a year or two ago, you could... You couldn't turn on the news without videos of, of ISIS, you know, be- beheading Christians for their faith over in Syria and, and, you know, in the Middle East. And you see those videos and it's like, God, what are you doing? And we know there's two kingdoms at work here. There, there's, you know, there's the kingdom of God and then there's the kingdom of this world. And sometimes it looks like the world is winning. You turn on, on the news or anytime you read like, you know, from, from Christians or whatever, and so always talking about the left and talking about you know, the laws and all this stuff. And it's like, God, what, what are you doing in this world? Are you even paying attention to, to your church or what's going on? And when you read through Scripture, there's just these times where, man, if you're, you're reading along, you're like, man, there, there is absolutely no hope. And then at the last second, hope comes. At the last second, there's this like, dramatic reversal where, where God steps in, where, where the ultimate hero steps in, he, he saves the day and you get kind of this big comeback we like comebacks in America, sports stories I was looking up some of the greatest comebacks in history and they're really interesting or stories like the tortoise and the hare that, that really surprise you now, we expect it because we've, we've read it and it's been ingrained in us since we were a kid. But if, you, if you're reading the, the tortoise and the hare story for the first time, nobody sees the tortoise winning. Everybody expects the hare to win because the hare's fast and the hare knows what he's doing and hare's got all these strategies. And you know, for all intents and purposes, the, 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 hare, the hare is the hero of that story. Nobody expects it when, when the tortoise you know, comes back at the very end to win that thing. Or a few years ago in the NBA Finals when it was the Warriors and the Cavaliers, and I believe the Warriors went up three to nothing, and then the Cavaliers came back and won it. Like, no, nobody expects that to happen. But man, God is an expert at 
stepping in at the last minute when we least expect it and just saving the day. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 12 today. And it kind of it kind of looks like the deck is stacked against the church. Now, uh, when you're reading through the book of Acts, sometimes it's really easy to forget about uh, the chronology, uh, about how many years have passed. So church starts, Pentecost is probably, depending on when Jesus was crucified, which it gets skewed because he was not born um, at 1, 1 AD. He's probably born about 4 BC. Like we, we messed up the calendar somewhere along the line. So the church, Jesus is probably crucified somewhere around 29, 30 AD. And so he's resurrected. The church starts somewhere around 30 AD, somewhere around there. And um, we are probably, when Acts 12 takes place, we're probably about 13, 14 years later. So we've had the, the conversion of Saul several years in, in the past. We've had... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Philip and everybody traveling around from the from the uh, scattering that resulted from Stephen being stoned and the church kind of running off in, in all different directions. It's been about 13, 14 years. So our text this morning probably takes place right around 43, 44 AD. And the church had been going really well. It had been spreading like wildfire because of, uh, because of persecution, which initially kind of sounds like an oxymoron. But it's been shown that you can't stop the church. Wherever Christians go, the gospel goes. And people are just getting saved left and right. And uh, you've had awesome things happen. You've had Saul, who started the, the, the real persecution of the church, going around dragging people to jail, killing people, persecuting them. He's been, he's been changed. That's all happened within that period of time, within that little over a decade period. And things have been going pretty good. But you've also seen Gentiles welcomed into the church, and, and that's been going awesome. Church is very big at this time. You've seen uh, incredible generosity from churches, which you can read at the end of chapter 11. Uh, Barnabas and Saul took some uh, offering money from a church at Antioch. They took it to Jerusalem. Incredible generosity. But then the government steps in, and things get a little difficult. And what you get in Acts chapter 12 is really a tale of two kings. You see what happens between uh, King Herod Agrippa and King Jesus. You kind of get one of those good versus evil battles. And throughout most of it, it looks like Herod is winning. It looks like this ruler on earth, it kind of has the, the deck stacked against the church, against Christians. And man, it, it looks like he's going to win. It looks scary. Christians don't know what's going on. They don't have a lot of, sometimes it doesn't look like there's a lot of hope left and they wonder what they're doing in this world. So if you got your Bible, Acts chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 1, says this. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. All right, so this is, this is Herod Agrippa I. This is the grandson of Herod the Great, who you will remember from when Jesus was born. Uh, Herod the Great is the, was the king who had all the babies killed, and uh, he's, he's kind of the king who, he would do anything to have power and to keep power. He would kill anybody who got in his way, literally. It, I think he had his mom killed, he had his favorite wife killed, all kinds of people killed. His, his, his sons he had killed. Like he, he would kill anybody if he thought you were threatening his power. And so Herod Agrippa, his, his grandson, he, he, he grew up under this a little bit. When he was four, though, he, he, um, Herod had his dad killed. And he sent Herod Agrippa off to Rome to, to learn from the Romans. Uh, he became friends with Caligula, who'd, who'd become an emperor. He became friends with Claudius, who'd become an emperor. And um, this has absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's just funny. It's funny what you remember when you're standing up here. But Caligula, if you, study, if you want to study Roman emperors, he's fascinating. He, he once took his whole army. His, his, they're, they're on horses and everything. And he has them stand in front of the, the sea. And the guy's nuts. And he declares war on the sea. And he commands his, his horses and his soldiers to go fight the sea. 
true story. You know, I don't know who won, but you, you got to be pretty nutty to, to go fight the ocean. I mean, uh, but anyway, so he becomes friends with these people, and it's through these friendships that later on uh, he gets power. They, they let him kind of control basically almost the same territory that his grandfather controlled in Judea. And he shared some of his, his grandfather's murderous tendencies. He would do anything to keep power. He would do anything to, uh, to, to have peace so that he would look good among the Jews and, and, and among the Romans. And he knew all about Christians. Uh, it was his uncle that had tried Jesus uh, before he was crucified. And the Jews already were not Herod's biggest fan because uh, he's not a pure Jew. So they kind of looked at him as a kind of a second-rate king. And so he wants to persecute Christians. So he gets this brilliant idea. Okay, I'm going I'm, I'm to kind of chop the head off the snake. I'm going to get the, some of the most important people, and I'm going to see what they think of me then. So he gets James. This is James, the brother of John. James the Less, as he's called, which is an unfortunate nickname. But, uh, and he has him, and he has him killed. He cuts... He has him beheaded. So it's the government doing this rather than the Jews because the Jews would have stoned him. So the government has stepped in and has sanctioned killing Christians, especially Christian leaders. So that's, that's, that's kind of scary. But actually Jesus, Jesus, without in so many words telling James or telling James that this would happen, he told him. You can look in Mark 10, 38, and it says this. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus teacher they said we want you to do for us whatever we ask what do you want me to do for you he asked they replied let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory you don't know what you're asking jesus said can you drink the cup i drink or be baptized with the baptism i'm baptized with we can they answered and jesus said to them you will drink the cup i drink and be baptized with the baptism i'm baptism with but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant these places belong to those for whom they've been prepared so back years ago, Jesus had told James and John that uh, you're, you're going to drink the same suffering that I drink. So James gets killed here. James is the first apostle to be martyred for Jesus. And it just goes to show us that none of us are immune to suffering or even death for Christ. And things are starting to look a little dim for the church. But it's Tertullian, kind of this first uh, church historian. And he, he wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So in, instead of having the effect of killing the church, weakening the church, it has the effect of strengthening and, and growing the church. And when, when Herod Agrippa killed James, and he saw that the Jews really liked this, they got all excited about this. He thought, oh, I know, I, I can one-up this. I know what will curry me in their favor even more. And so he arrested Peter. Peter, the de facto leader of the apostles. And he takes him. And this Herod, man, he would do anything to keep power. He loved power. Every, it ran in the family. All of the Herods were obsessed with power and doing whatever it took to maintain it. And being... Everybody who seeks power in this world is dramatically opposed to the gospel of Christ. I mean, you look at, you look at what Jesus said in Mark 10, 42, right after he told James and John that they're going to suffer for him. The, the disciples start arguing that, uh, oh, who's, who's the greatest? Why, why do they get such a, such a good spot in the kingdom? You know, what, what about us, Jesus? We, we should get something. And Jesus said to them, he says, uh, he called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever be, wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And look at Jesus. He's got all the power in the world at his hands. And yet, uh, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 5, he goes, basically, look at Jesus. 
who, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what, that's what real power does. But Herod, he wanted to keep his power. He, he loved his political power and the prestige that came with that. And he thought, oh, if they like me killing James, they're going to love me killing Peter. So he schemes and he plots and he manipulates to get his way. You read on in verse 3. It says, When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So he arrests Peter. He must be pretty happy with himself, patting himself on the back. But he can't do anything until after Passover's over because it was against the law to have any kind of trials or executions during Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, that followed that. So he had to wait till it's all over. So he puts him in jail. And this guy does not take any chances uh, with, with Peter's incarceration. He puts 16 soldiers on the guy. You know, maybe he heard about Peter earlier when, when uh, an angel had come and set Peter free from jail back in Acts, earlier in Acts. Maybe he'd heard about that and he thought, okay, I'm, I'm, that's not happening again under my watch. So he gets 16 soldiers. And how this would work is four of them would really be assigned to Peter. Two of them would be chained to him inside the cell, and two of them would stand outside the cell guarding him just to make sure that nothing funny happened or he didn't try to escape or attack the guards. But basically, all this is written in here to show that there's no way on earth that Peter could escape on his own. He's, he's not getting up out of there, breaking out of jail with anything that he does on his own. It's a humanly impossible situation. But oftentimes in life, especially when God is in the mix, things are not what they seem. Read on in verse 5. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but... Notice the conjunction there. Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Luke wants to show us that prayers are more powerful than Herod. And when, when, uh, when he says that they were earnestly praying for him, Luke uses the same Greek word that he used back in Luke uh, to describe Jesus when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested and crucified. And if you remember from that story, uh, Luke writes that Jesus was praying so hard that his sweat became like drops of blood as he's praying. So this isn't just, you know, God, thank you for this day. Please help, you know, Peter in jail. This is some earnest praying where people are having some serious prayer time and maybe their sweat is like drops of blood. I don't know. But this isn't just like praying for a, for a meal. People are down on their knees or on their faces. They're crying out to God for the release of Peter. So how's your prayer life? When you, when you really need something, how's your prayer life? James, the brother of Jesus, will later write in, 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 uh, in his letter to the church, James 5, 13, says, anyone of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. And you go on down, and it says, uh, it says the prayer of a righteous person person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are, but he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So while Herod was plotting against Peter, the church was praying for Peter. Don't, don't miss that in here. See, we don't, we don't fight like the world does. Herod wants to fight with, with plotting and scheming and murder and, and, and all these, you know, political schemes. But Paul tells us in Ephesians, says, we don't fight like the world. Our, our enemy 
as, as much as Herod is, is evil and is plotting against the church, he's not their ultimate enemy. He's a servant of the enemy, but Herod's not their ultimate enemy. And Paul will say in Ephesians 6 that, that we don't fight like the world does. The world fights with swords and guns and knives and all this other stuff, but we, we fight with prayer. We fight with the word of God. We don't wage war like the world does. And it's, it's funny to me that they're praying during the time of Passover. What happened during the first Passover? Anybody remember? God set a whole bunch of people free. Remember that? Brought Israel out of Egypt. That's a pretty cool story. Go back in Exodus and read that if, if you've forgotten about that. So Passover is a pretty good time for God to set people free. But I wonder, here Peter is in jail. What was he thinking about? He's in prison. He can't celebrate Passover. He, he's already done this all before. Thanks to Luke, we, we know what he was thinking. Uh, verse 6 and 7, it says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. So here Peter is, the night before he's going to be tried and uh, probably executed with kind of a mock jury and all that. Here he is, for all intents and purposes, his last night on earth. And he's sleeping. The guy's not worried about dying, about being executed, about having his head potentially cut off. He is sound asleep between the two guards that, that he's chained to. Sleeping like a baby. See, this isn't the same Peter who years before ran away and denied Jesus. Went back to fishing again, left that life. This is a Peter who's been drastically changed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of Jesus. That guy's not worried at all. Here the angel has to come, and the, the light doesn't even wake him up. He's so sound asleep. The angel has to jab him in the side and say, hey, wake up. You know, alarm's going off. It's time to get up. Paul later looks like this when he's in prison several times. We'll get there in Acts 16, and him, but him and Silas are, are, are in the jail cell. They're in the bonds, so they're, they're not comfortable at all. Their hands and feet are the most uncomfortable position you can imagine. And yet they just, they're praising God. They, ha they have a worship service where they can't probably even lift their heads, but they're, they're praising Jesus. I mean, how can you be so calm in the midst of suffering and imprisonment? See, they knew Jesus in such an intimate way that they never felt closer to him than when they suffered. You know, there's this the closeness, I think, in Scripture that can only come through suffering. And you'll never experience it if all we do is run from it, if all we do is try to get away from it. I mean, you read about Paul at the end of his life, and he, he's writing to Timothy and he's not worried at all about dying for Jesus. He, he's not worried at all. In fact, he's looking forward to it. He's embracing it. But what he is worried about is not him dying for Jesus, but rather people not living for Jesus. That's what he worries about when he's about to die. So, get back to the story here. The angel frees Peter, the angel of the Lord. Peter goes to Mary's house. Mary is the mother of John Mark, who's going to feature prominently here in a little bit in Acts. And uh, this may indeed be the house where Jesus and his disciples shared the Last Supper years before. A servant girl recognizes him. She recognizes his voice because he's, he's up there knocking at the door. Hey, let me in. It's Peter. Girl recognizes his voice. She goes and tells the other people in the house that he's outside. And they think she's out of her mind. Girl, you need to go back to sleep. You know, you're not, you're not thinking right. There's no way Peter's outside the door. Peter's locked up in jail right now. What have they been praying for? I mean, they've been praying that God would set Peter free. And here this girl says, hey, Peter's outside. God's answered your prayers. No, you're out of your mind. There's no way Peter's outside. Here the, the very answer to the prayers is standing at the door, and they don't believe it. You know, God had done exactly what they asked for, and they're doubting it. 
They thought, oh, if, if he's out there, it must be his, what Jews believe, what they called guardian angels. You know, the, the, uh, they would supposedly take the appearance of a person shortly after their death and they would appear to people. They thought, oh, it must just be his angel. <laughs> when they just got done earnestly praying like crazy for God to release Peter, they didn't even think that God would do that. That's kind of like our prayer life sometimes. We, we pray for something so hard and for so long and God finally answers it. Sometimes like, we, we don't believe it. You know, I don't, I don't think that's just a problem back in, uh, in, in the days of, of Acts here. But finally, they go to the door. Peter tells them to tell James and the others about his release. See, James, this is the brother of Jesus, not the James who had just been killed. And James had become a Christian during uh, the, the 14 or so years that has passed. And uh, James ends up getting martyred for his faith too, but by this time, he's already a leader in the church. Just goes to show you that anybody can become a Christian. Anybody can be saved by Jesus. Even if they've spent their whole life denying Jesus and thinking he's crazy, anybody can be saved by Jesus. There's nobody that's too far gone. And Peter goes into hiding for a while because even though he's free, you know, he's still a wanted man. And just even though the, the scripture tells us that we will be persecuted, we will suffer for our faith, we, we don't need to seek it out. So Peter goes into hiding for a while. And one of the reasons that Luke has this story in here, yes, it's to show God working through it, Peter and everything, but it's also to put a bookends on the story of Peter so that he can get ready to focus on the story of Paul. Because uh, this is pretty well the end of Peter's story. He'll appear briefly in Acts 15, but uh, the door kind of shuts on Peter's ministry as far as the book of Acts is concerned. And uh, next chapter starts Saul's ministry or Paul's ministry. And, um, but before we get to that, we got to deal with Herod here. So morning comes. Herod wakes up, excited to try Peter and to kill Peter eventually. But Peter's nowhere to be found. The guards are still there inside the cell and outside the cell. So Herod makes them all search for Peter, and they can't find him. The guards are all questioned. We've been here all night. No, nobody came. He, he was here, and then he wasn't here. We don't know what happened. And under Roman law, if you let a prisoner get away... You faced his sentence. So since Peter was going to die, uh, they died. Herod killed all of them, which is completely in keeping with his character. And Herod's this great man of power, like we talked about, so he thinks. And he uses that power to just end 16 lives like nothing else. So he's on a power trip, and then he leaves for Caesarea. And to make a long story short, he's giving an address to the people there. He's got his royal robes on. He, he, he's looking good. He's shining. Josephus, a uh, Jewish historian, he tells us that he was wearing all silver and he shined like crazy. He's, he's reflecting the sun. And um, so he sits on his throne. He addresses the people. And then uh, he's given such a good speech that, and, and he looks so good that the people start shouting that this is the voice of a God and not a man. And Herod likes that. He likes that praise. He soaks it in. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't deflect it. He doesn't give any honor to God. And so the same angel of the Lord that had earlier come and released Peter from prison shows up in front of Herod at Caesarea and strikes him dead. Because he didn't give God praise. So this story starts with, with um, Herod killing James the apostle. And it ends with the angel of the Lord killing Herod. And again, Josephus writes that uh, Herod, Herod uh, at this time, he got some kind of an intestinal worm that really messed with his intestines for like five days, and he died a very excruciating death. That does not sound fun, intestinal worms. But you get down to verse 24, and it says, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. See, there's no force on earth that can stop the gospel. There, there's no force on earth that can stop its spread through death or through life. The gospel spreads. We've seen that all throughout the book of Acts so far. And things look bad. And then you get to verse 24. It shows God is still sovereign. 
He's still in control. And while his messengers can be chained up, his message cannot. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So this is a tale of two kings. Uh, look at King Jesus versus King Herod. So one is given power, did everything he could to keep it, even killing others so he could live a comfortable life. Ends up being killed by the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> One's born with all the power in the world, gives it all up, leaving heaven for earth, living a humble life, even choosing to die so that others might live, to be raised to life again by the power of the Holy Spirit. One is killed because of his pride, the other raised to life again as a first fruit so that we too might have eternal life. Which king do you want to follow? Which king do you want to serve? Which king do you serve? You know, this world's filled with kings who, who want power and will do anything to keep it. Their ways all lead to death. But there's only one king whose reign leads to life, who gave up everything to save you, and his name is Jesus. And he's a good king. He's the best king. And his reign will never end. All other kings will eventually bend their knee to this king, as will you and I. The only question is whether it's going to be willingly or not. Will you pray with me?